It is a joy to be in worship together this Sunday morning. I want to welcome all the folks joining us online as well. I invite you to register your attendance with us on our website so that we can know that you are worshiping with us today. I want to draw your attention to a few announcements that we have this morning. If anyone between the ages of 11 to 18 is interested in doing hand chimes for Youth Sunday, you're invited to come to the church today at 4 o'clock for practice for that. And so we're looking forward to that time together as, as we prepare for Youth Sunday. We're also going to have acolyte training today in the sanctuary from 12 to 1230. Uh, this is for anyone third through eighth grade that's interested in doing this and invite to parents and family members to attend that time together as well. Everyone is welcome to adult fellowship tomorrow um, at six o'clock in Ensminger Hall. Becky and Terry Ohm will be hosting that. Um, our church is seeking an organist and so if you know of anyone that plays the organist or if you play the organist we'd love to hear from you about that. You can email um, Dave Graybill at dgraybill at keithumc.org. We are offering two fall Wednesday night study options. Um, they're going to both be at 6 o'clock. You can come in person or you can join us on Zoom. Um, Dave's going to be sharing a study on the life of King David in the young adult Sunday school class upstairs. I'm going to be sharing a study on Will Shelton's book, The Roots of Eden, um, in Ensminger Hall. So we'd love for you to, to come and join us for one of those, those studies. Um, we're Thankful for our flowers this morning, which are given in loving memory of Scott and Mural Mayfield by Clarice and Dean Baggins. We're thankful for our flowers here uh, this morning. At this time, let's listen to this morning's prelude as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship this day. As many of you know, yesterday marked the 20 years since 9-11. Um, Dave and I were talking this morning, and, and we had both seen this post on Facebook that's been circulating around. It was a conversation between Tom Beamer and a 911 dispatch, um, and they, they shared in a conversation, and part of their conversation, um, they, they shared the Lord's Prayer, and they also shared Psalm 23 um, together. And so... Um, it's by coincidence that we are sharing in, in Psalm 23 this morning as our call to worship. But I wanted to share that with you as, as, a, as a way to remember um, what happened 20 years ago. It's hard to believe that that was 20 years ago. But um, as a way we can think of this and lift this up as our prayer this, this morning. Um, let's stand together for our call to worship, Psalm 23. It's in our hymnal, page 137.
I will read the light print and invite you to respond with the bold print. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Let us now join in our opening hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, number 381. Let us sing together. standing as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed number 881 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite our children's director, Reagan Kelly, to come forward to offer our third grade Bible presentation. Good morning, everyone. This is a special day on which our church will present Bibles to the members of the third grade class. It is an important tradition, a day to be remembered by our community of faith. By this act, we acknowledge that these students now have the skills to read and to study the sacred scriptures that guide our faith and religious practice. The third graders receiving their Bibles today are Ella Jacobs, Scott Mayfield, Ansley Montooth, Henley Kate Parker, Sean Parker, Jackson Shrek, Carl Mason Sumner, and Georgia Sumner. So if any of those are here, please come forward. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so the Gospel of John starts like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Your Bibles are wrapped in brown paper to remind you that this is a very old book. It is 30 centuries old. Some parts of this book were composed more than a thousand years before Christ. Some of these stories come down to us from a time before people could even write. This is an ancient, sacred book of our faith. Handle it carefully. Okay, can you repeat after me? This Bible is ancient. Awesome. And you can go ahead and unwrap your brown paper. I'll have you a trash bag right there. Part of Psalm 19 says, the Lord's judgments are true. All of these are righteous. They are more desirable than gold, that, than tons of pure gold. Your Bible is now wrapped in gold foil. This is to remind you that the Bible is very valuable, more valuable than gold. People have been imprisoned because they've read this book. Some have died to save this book from being destroyed. Our Bible, our sacred scripture, is both ancient and valuable. So can you repeat after me? This Bible is valuable. Awesome. Okay, you can unwrap your gold. The Bible says, when the rainbow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. Your Bible is filled with wonderful stories. You have heard them in Sunday school, but now you can read them for yourself. There are adventure stories and miracle stories, stories of heroes and stories of villains. Some of these stories are happy and some of them are sad. As you read them, look beyond the stories. Look for the lessons that they teach. Try to understand how these lessons can be used in your own life. Noah teaches us 
the lesson of trusting in God. You can use your own God trust to seek answers that await you in these stories. Your Bible is not only ancient and valuable, but also entertaining and fun. So if you can repeat after me, the Bible is entertaining and fun. Okay, now you can remember. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp before my feet and a light for my journey. The white color is to remind us that the scripture is inspired. It came from a people who had a special understanding of God. It is not like any other book you will ever own. When you read it, you will understand what God is like and what God wants you to do. You have a message from God wrapped in this ancient valuable, entertaining, inspired scripture. So repeat after me, the Bible is inspired. So, okay, you can go ahead and unwrap that. Receive the word of God, learn its stories, and study its word. Its stories belong to us all, and these words speak to us all. They tell us who we are. They tell us that we belong to one another, for we are the people of God. And if the congregation can join me in your bulletins on the gathering side, there should be a congregational response that we can all read together. Okay, we rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you and your family and us as you use this holy Bible in your home, in Sunday school, and in worship services. We will learn together and grow in our love for God's word. Amen. You, Reagan. Wonderful, Jackson. You, you were a very careful unwrapper of the. That very good. Did a wonderful job, and um, you know I still have my. I got our Bibles in fourth grade, so it just shows how advanced children are these days. And now we're giving them out in third grade. Um, but we're just may that truly be a blessing to you uh, and among us uh, in the years to come. So that's a joy. It's always a joy to share that. Uh, that gift with our children, uh, the gift of God's Word. Um, also, as we uh, come to our time of joys and concerns, it was a joy. Um, last Sunday evening, uh, Tom and Teresa Hughes' daughter, Michelle, uh, was united in marriage with Dran Crenshaw up at the top of the brow of Signal Mountain. And so that was a, a beautiful uh, evening to do that. I think there will be a celebration or reception uh, in a few weeks, but uh, it was a joy to share in that, uh, in that special service uh, with, with their close family there. And so uh, if you see Tom and Teresa uh, sometime at the church or throughout this week, uh, you can just share uh, joys with them uh, in that. Also, it was a joy this past Wednesday, we wrapped up our summer study of the different uh, Christian denominations. We had uh, the uh, African-American Methodist traditions were uh, represented here this past week. Roxy Ann Shurls, the pastor at St. Mark uh, AME Zion Church up by the YMCA was here with some of her congregation members. And um, so that was just a joy, uh, not only that session, but I think throughout the whole summer. And so just grateful for all those who participated in that and helped make that such a special study uh, through this summer. Um, It was also a joy yesterday. uh, The Athens Area Ministerial Association had a hot dog lunch for 
some of our police and firefighters and first responders down at Market Park. And so I know some other folks stopped by uh, for that. And so we are certainly uh, continue to be grateful for their service among us, uh, especially as we are remembering uh, 20 years ago, yesterday, 9-11, but uh, even more recently through the COVID uh, time and, and all the services that they are continuing to provide our communities in these times. Um, are there other joys, uh, celebrations, thanksgivings that you have that you'd like to lift up and share with one another this day? Well, I know we do have a number of uh, folks and concerns on our hearts, uh, and I hope that you find uh, the prayer list in your bulletin, and, and we'll uh, spend some time through the week uh, lifting up these names uh, and these needs in your own times of prayer. Uh, just across the top, especially we want to continue to lift up those who are hospitalized, um, those who are grieving, uh, losses uh, among us. We want to lift up our health care workers. I've been the hospital chaplain this past week, and I know that they are just exhausted. They're working multiple shifts beyond normal shifts. Uh, the hospital is very busy, very full. Uh, and so we want to continue to lift up families with COVID-19 as we've seen some of the highest uh, active case numbers uh, in the past couple weeks since this began. So we want to lift up all those folks in our prayers. Again, continuing to lift up our first responders and those serving in the military. Uh, we want to also lift up the family of Martha Ann Sullins. Martha Ann passed away last Sunday morning down in Cleveland, 102 years old. And uh, Mike Hubble uh, shared at her service this past week uh, and, and all the things that she has witnessed in her lifetime uh, and has been a part of. And certainly a beloved member here of the home service Sunday school class. And so our prayers go out uh, to her family and her friends. Are there other concerns, other needs or situations that you would like to lift up this morning? Are some of us carrying concerns that are unspoken, that are on our hearts, that we'd acknowledge uh, with the lifting of our hands? And certainly, um, if there are needs that you would like for us to know about, ways that we can come alongside you in prayer, there's an opportunity on the response card to uh, note that for us. Um, and also, if you're worshiping with us online, you can let us know of any prayer concerns that you have by emailing us at prayer at keithumc.org. Uh, it's always a privilege to come alongside you in the prayers that are on your hearts and minds. Um, you're always welcome, too, to join with me uh, in prayer, kneeling here at the altar railing uh, or in your pews as we go now to the Lord in this time of prayer. O oh God of this nation and of all the nations, you are the God of all peoples in all times and all places. We remember this weekend the terror and the tragedy that we experienced in this nation 20 years ago this weekend. And as difficult as it can sometimes be for us to remember traumatic events of that day and other days, we remember the lives that were lost and the sacrifices of so many to try and help and save others on that day. The lingering wounds to lungs and lives, to hearts and minds since that day. We honor our military and those who have served and have sacrificed in the war on terror in Afghanistan and Iraq for the peace and stability that they have sought to promote and to preserve in those places. And we continue to pray for those people and places where peace seems so elusive, especially in Afghanistan. We continue to thank you for all of the helpers today, all of those first responders and firefighters and police and so many others, health care workers who try to help and to serve us in our community. We remember, too, how the events of that day united us as a people in a way that we have not been able to sustain since then. Even as if we have been called upon to face an enemy that is no less terrorizing in COVID. Lord, we pray that our recollections of the events of that day and our 
collective spirit might recall us toward a greater unity of purpose and resolve and resilience in our own day. And just as so many turn to You, O Lord, in that time in prayer for strength and for courage, for compassion, so too may Your Spirit turn the hearts of Your people toward Your heart this day. That we may seek You, that we may serve one another with our whole hearts and with the love that we have seen in the life of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. For we offer our prayer in His name and in the Spirit in which He gave us this prayer for us to pray together as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we prepare to uh, start into our new sermon series on uh, the life of King David, who is described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart, um, I'd invite you to take your hymnals and let's turn to number 472 and let's sing together, Near to the Heart of God. standing for the reading of our scripture this morning and it comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel the 16th chapter verses 1 through 13 this is the story of David anointed as king hear now God's word the Lord said to Samuel how long will you grieve over Saul I've rejected him from being king over Israel fill your horn with oil and set out I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I've provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. 
But Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. So we're starting this new series on the life of King David. Uh, and David, uh, I happen to know, is a name that means beloved. And there's no one probably in all of Scripture more beloved than this David. Uh, David is, uh, he's, he's beloved of King Saul, even though Saul also, it's kind of a love-hate relationship. <laughs> Saul a couple times tries to kill David, but um, he does love him. He's drawn to David. He, he, he loves David. Um, the first time in the Bible we're told that a woman loves a man is Saul's daughter, Michelle, Michal, um, who loves David. David uh, has a friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan, and they loved one another uh, very, very, very much. Um, there's the people of Israel loved David and looked at David as sort of the, the best king. That was, the, that was sort of the glory years of Israel. And even God, we're told, loved David. We're told a couple times in the Scripture that David was a man after God's own heart. And so there's probably no one in all of the Scriptures as beloved as David. Um, but there's also probably no one in all of the Scriptures who is as complicated as David. David is. Very complex figure. Um, the uh, poet Walt Whitman liked to say of himself, um, I contain multitudes. And King David contains multitudes. Uh, there's no one, I mean, he, he's capable of great and dramatic acts. Um, he's capable of unswerving loyalty to his family and friends. He's capable of magnanimous compassion. But he's also capable of astonishing cruelty. He's a complicated figure. Um, he contains multitudes. And maybe that's part of why we find David so compelling. We're so drawn to him because uh, maybe we see something of ourselves in him. We're drawn to things that the, the, the good that he does is the good we want to do. The, the evil he does is the things we, we wrestle with ourselves. And so we see in David somewhat of a mirror of ourselves. One uh, pastor and author, J.S. Park, has said of David, he's deeply flawed, but still beloved. And I think that's what we want to see of ourselves. We're deeply flawed, but we want to see ourselves as still beloved of God. Eugene Peterson, who uh, paraphrased the Bible in the message, uh, said that... Uh, David's story is the most extensive story of anyone in all the Bible. And at first I read that and I thought, well, wait a minute. 
there's Jesus, <laughs> right? But then I looked back and I counted up the number of chapters that tells the story of David, and it's over 40 chapters. Uh, that's longer than any of the gospel stories of, of Jesus. Over 40 chapters tell the story of David, and that's not even counting any of the Psalms that are attributed to David's writing. So it's one of the most extensive stories of, of in the Bible. And, you know, we allude to David's story all the time in our culture. Anytime there's an underdog story, uh, it's David and Goliath. Anytime the friendship, we look at David and Jonathan. Anytime there's a sex scandal, it's like David and Bathsheba. Um, anytime there's a succession of power, we look at David and, and how uh, his sons uh, fought for succession. Uh, so many times, family dysfunction, we can look at David. So many times we can draw on his story. And so David's story, it starts here in the scripture uh, that I just read to you. Uh, again, this happens about, uh, as Reagan mentioned, about a thousand years before Jesus' time. Uh, David was born in a time when Israel was sort of making this transition from a time of judges, which were sort of regional leaders among the people, to a time of kings. Israel said, we want to be like the other nations around us. We want a king too. And there was a fellow named Samuel who was uh, kind of a whole bunch of things. He was a prophet. He was a priest. He was a judge. He was a seer, um, kind of someone who could see into the future. He was a seer. We know that because he wore seer sucker suits. And um, Samuel says, you don't want a king. You think you want a king. You don't want a king. The king's going to tax you. The king's going to take all your kids and put them into military and service, and they're going to die. You don't want a king. And they say, we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. So it's all right. If you want a king so much, and God said, if they want a king, give them a king. So the first king was King Saul. King Saul. And King Saul, we're told, was, um, was handsome. There was no one more handsome than King Saul in all of Israel. And he was tall. He stood head and shoulders above everyone else. So he was tall, dark, and handsome, you know, that perfect king. Except he wasn't the perfect king. He, he disappointed Saul and the Lord any number of ways, he, um, he uh, committed a, an unlawful sacrifice, acted as priest instead of Samuel. He uh, disobeyed the command to kill all of the Amalekites. He left the king and, and some of the others living, so he disobeyed that command. And possibly worst of all, he set up a monument to himself. And after he'd done all that, the Lord comes to Samuel and says, I'm done with Saul. He's not going to be a king. We need a new king. So he says, I want you to set out and I want you to go and anoint who, the person who's going to be the new king. And so that's where our scripture starts off today. Uh, starts off, in fact, Samuel's grieving. Samuel's grieving over Saul. He had invested so much in Saul, tried to make him the best king he could be. It was such a failure, so he was grieving. So the Lord comes to him and says, Samuel, how long are you going to continue to grieve over Saul? Saul. It's time to move on. It's time to make a new beginning. So out of this atmosphere of grief, God sends Samuel. He goes, I want you to go down to Bethlehem and meet this fellow Jesse. And one of his sons is going to be the one that I'm going to tell you to anoint as king. So Samuel sets out for Bethlehem to find this Jesse. Now, Jesse, we may remember just a few weeks ago when we were uh, looking at the story of Ruth. Remember Ruth? Uh, she was a Moabite, okay? She wasn't an Israelite. She was a foreigner. She was a Moabite. But she was also the great-grandmother of Jesse, who had these sons. So I, I, wonder, if, I wonder if Samuel knew this. Uh, knew that, oh, see, that's kind of mixed mixed. Go check it out. So he goes down there, and uh, so the first thing he does, uh, first thing he does is really he goes, how can I go down there? Uh, if King Saul finds out about it, he's going to kill me. Because what he's doing to anoint a new king while the current king is still serving, that's treason, and that's punishable by death. So Samuel's like, wait a minute, you want me to do what? And so God says, I want you to go down there, and he says, take a heifer with you, and tell them that you've come to sacrifice to the Lord. 
which some scholars have picked up on that and thinking, wait a minute, was the Lord telling Samuel to, to sort of say a little white lie about why he was coming there? Uh, you know, take a heifer and feed them this bull about I'm come to sacrifice. I don't know. Well, he don't know. But because he does, he goes down there and he, sacrifice, he does sacrifice. So he gets down there and the elders of Bethlehem come out and they are trembling. They're afraid. With good reason, because just a few verses up at the end of chapter 15, Samuel has just um, killed the king of the Amalekites that Saul wouldn't kill. So he's, you know, they say, are you coming peaceably? (laughs) And he says, yes, I'm coming peaceably. I've come to offer a sacrifice. So he says, go sanctify yourselves, get ready for the sacrifice. And so he invites Jesse and his sons to sanctify themselves and come to the sacrifice. And so they do. And so uh, when they do, uh, Je- uh, Samuel looks at uh, Eliab, who's the oldest son, and he looks at him and he says, surely this must be the one the Lord has in mind. I mean, he's got a great name. Eliab means God is my father. He he's comes from you know, a, good, a good family of Benjaminites, I mean, the, uh, the Bethlehemites, family of Judah, uh, all these things going for him. And the Lord says to Samuel, no, he's not the one. He says, don't look upon his height or his appearance or anything on the outward appearance that would say he's the one because he says mortals look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. He's not the one. So, Jesse calls his next son, Abinadab. Samuel says, nope, it's not him. Then Shema parades in front of him. Nope, it's not him. Jesse has seven sons that are there. All seven of them pass in front of him. And Samuel says, none of these are the one the Lord's chosen. So he finally looks at Jesse and said, are, are all your sons here? And Jesse says, well, there's the, there's the youngest, the, the runt of the litter. Um, he's on sheep duty back at the ranch. You know, and sheep duty's got to be the worst job, right? That's what they give the youngest. <laughs> Let him do it. So Samuel says, well, we're, we'll wait right here. We, we won't even sit down until you go get him. So they go and they get the youngest and he comes up. And then we're told that, um, that he was handsome. And that he had beautiful eyes. And he had a ruddy complexion. You know, red kind of fierce complexion. So immediately, we're kind of led to think, oh, it's not going to be him either. Because we've already been told the Lord doesn't look on outward appearances. Um, He's already been down that road, tall, dark, and handsome. That was Saul. We saw how that ended up. So when it said, oh, David was ruddy, beautiful eyes, handsome. We're like, I guess Samuel's going to strike out again says that's the one I want you to take horn of oil and anoint him he's going to be the new king of Israel now that might be surprising to us in a lot of different ways might be surprising that uh, hey he's 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 got the looks and apparently got the heart he's got the things on the outward appearance that we are drawn to and apparently he's got the heart that God is drawn to But it's not the first time that God has chosen the youngest for a position of of glory. It goes back to uh, Isaac over Ishmael and uh, Jacob over his older brother Esau and and Joseph over all of his older brothers uh, above him. God kind of has a way of doing this, of choosing the unexpected, those who, uh, who are in the lower positions for positions of glory. Uh, and, and it's not because, it sort of shows the utter gratuitousness of God's grace in choosing leadership. It's not because of anything that David has said or done up to this point. It's the first time we meet David. We don't even learn his name until the last verse. All he's doing is out keeping the sheep. It's not because of anything David has said or done that earns him this honor. And it kind of reminds me of when Jesus appears in some of the Gospels. 
and is baptized, is anointed. That's what Messiah means, is anointed. When Jesus comes to the Jordan River to be baptized by his cousin John, he hasn't done anything. He hasn't said a word. He hasn't healed a soul in the Gospels. The first thing is he's anointed. He's called beloved of God. You are my beloved in whom my soul takes such great delight. It kind of reminds us if, if you've been baptized as a baby, as an infant, as, as I was and, and some of you were. That's before, before we could ever say or do anything for God, that was God's way of anointing us and doing for us and proclaiming us beloved. That's who we are because that's who God says we are. And we live the rest of our lives with that anointing still wet on our brow telling us that's who we are. David will live the rest of his life in his kingship anointed by this being called beloved and by the spirit that rests mightily on him from that time forward. So it's not the first time he's chosen the youngest or the unexpected. And it's not also the first time he's chosen a shepherd. Uh, we look back in the story and we see that Jacob was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd when God called him to lead. And so, you know, it sounds all romantic. One author says, it sounds all romantic to be a shepherd unless you're actually there. And I don't know if any of you have kept shepherds or farm, but it, you know, it's dirty, smelly long exhausting work sheep duty again it's not it's not the choice of the chores around the household but as the old rabbis were fond of saying when God wants to choose a leader God looks at how someone tends the sheep and maybe when God wanted to choose this new king of Israel God looked and saw something in the way that David the youngest of the sons kept those sheep you know we would look at shepherds then possibly today on the outward appearance say oh they, they don't have that leadership potential they don't have that kingship potential but again the lord doesn't look on outward appearances like we do the lord looks on the heart the lord looks even deeper than than we do even deeper than samuel the seer can see the Lord looks on the heart and so when the Lord looks on your heart what do you think the Lord sees now if you're like me immediately we go to negative things you know the ways we fail and fall short and our faults but the Lord possibly sees something in you that maybe nobody else can see in you. That maybe you can't even see in yourself. When the Lord looks on your heart, what do you think the Lord sees? When the Lord looked on David's heart, what do you think the Lord saw in David? Well, we'll see some of what the Lord saw in David's heart um, as we walk through his story. As we see some of the things he, he's done and, and some of the relationships that he was involved in and the leadership that he was able to provide. Um, we'll see some of his heart. And in his Psalms in particular, which will kind of pair along the way with this, we see him uh, praising God repeatedly. He says, with my whole heart. We also see him praying, God, create in me a clean heart. And at one point he says, he prays, oh God, Give me an undivided heart. One of the books that we're reading about David calls David, says he has a divided heart. And he does. Throughout his story. He's seeking God's will for what he should do in all kinds of situations. But sometimes even when he gets that, what does he do? He goes and does his own thing. He goes off on his own way. David has a divided heart. So too do we. We have divided hearts. But there's one thing that David did. David knew that he loved God. And he knew that he was loved by God. And he knew, even as a shepherd boy, he knew who his shepherd 
was. And that's, that's the making of a fine king. So thanks be to God that God has chosen David, called him beloved. Thanks be to God that God has chosen you and me and calls each one of us beloved. And the Spirit of God in Christ can rest mightily upon each one of us as well. Amen. As we think about um, what was in David's heart, what was in all of our own hearts, um, how we can be people who are seeking after God's own heart, um, I'd like to invite you to stand now and turn in our hymnals as we sing our closing hymn today. Uh, There's within my heart a melody. It's number 380, and we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of 380. Let us stand and sing. finish up our worship this morning as we go out back out into the world uh, just inv- remind you that of the offering plates that are available uh, on the way out if you'd like to continue to support our mission and ministry uh, of our church and our community uh, touching lives uh, putting bibles in hands of third graders um, the youth are going to be meeting to this afternoon to plan and work on uh, youth sunday here uh, for us in a couple weeks So lots of good things happening. We've got Bible studies coming up. I hope that you'll find ways to plug into a small group if you're not already a part of a small group. If you're uh, interested, any of you, or if you know of someone who might be interested in learning more about the church or uniting in membership with the church, please let us know. We're always happy to have those kinds of conversations as we help uh, folks as we journey together along this journey of faith and discipleship. And so let us go and... May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit that rested upon David years ago, may come to rest upon all of our hearts and minds this day, that we may be the people that God wants us to be, to share the love and life of Christ out in the world. So go in his grace and in his peace. Amen.